Hi everyone, here's what's bothering me today. So, Dems are of course a failure. Amy Coney Barrett is confirmed to the Supreme Court. And looks like it's still full steam ahead for Trump and the Republicans to do everything they can to try and rig this election. Now, what this means is that I kind of need to talk about my plan a bit earlier. Now, here's the thing. With this news and everything, this means that no matter what, we are probably going to see here in Canada a large influx of American refugees, regardless of who wins in November. If it's Trump, we're going to see a huge influx of minorities, women, and members of the LGBT community because they know what's coming next. If Joe Biden wins, we're still probably going to see some people show up because Lord knows the right wing is going to make it so that Joe Biden has a hell of a time governing and they're going to use that as legitimization for further authoritarianism. And so that's going to spur a lot of people to say, oh, it's too dangerous. We need to leave. No matter what, people come up here. So how do we deal with that, especially when the weather starts to get colder? So here's my plan. And I need as many people as possible to actually add on to this, try and confirm some information, and to like and share it so that more people can see this to see what options are available. So without further ado, let's go back in time to something known as the British Commonwealth Air Training Program. This was a massive program that had several airfields, and by several I mean like dozens if not hundreds, of airfields built from coast to coast across Canada. They were used to train members of the British Commonwealth, so Canada, Britain, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, etc. And they were training air crews so that they could be prepared for any kind of flying job when they went over to fight in the war in Europe or elsewhere in Asia. And now a lot of these bases are derelict and basically lie in ruin in various corners of the country. And I'll get back to them in a bit. But basically, the crux of the plan is this. What happens to Canada when all of a sudden there's a huge wave of refugees on your doorstep and you're their only neighbor? So what happens when, for example, let's say one in 10 out of every American decide to move to Canada to try and claim refugee status? If so much as one in 10 Americans decides to do that, and that's just individuals, never mind families. If just one in 10 individuals decides to do that, that is a near doubling of Canada's population overnight. So how do we handle this? Is this even possible to handle in terms of a humanitarian crisis? And the answer is a solid maybe. So the nation of Lebanon offers a lot of really interesting um, lessons for this because Lebanon is per capita the country with the highest percentage of refugees living amongst its populace. I think it's one out of every six or one out of every seven people in Lebanon is a refugee. Now, how they've managed to handle this is due to a lot of attention and money being thrown their way by the United Nations. Um, this means that if Canada has to face a similar situation, that is going to be one of the main jobs of the federal government to look at the UN for help and aid and funding in the international community. The federal government then should also kind of implement something of a hub policy. So many Americans will no doubt try and fly out of their parts of America into Canada. We should have hub cities or hub airports rather, of Vancouver, Calgary, Toronto, and Montreal. These are our four biggest airports. These are the ones that have the greatest connection to international destinations that would enable the further processing of, a bit of American refugees to the world at large. Um, if this becomes too much, then we also have nearby sort of secondary or tier two airports that could serve to help this purpose as well by doing charter flights. This would be cities such as Edmonton, Winnipeg, Ottawa, Halifax, Quebec City even, um, Newfoundland and Labrador's main airport in uh, St. John's, the capital of that province. So this is how we could help sort of send American refugees or expats back around the world so that whatever does come across our border is somewhat more manageable than it would be otherwise. But it's still a huge issue. 
So how do we feed and clothe these people, especially in our long winters, which if they show up after November 3rd, it's going to be winter. So how do we do that? Right now, the pandemic is a bit of a boon because this means that a lot of Airbnbs, hotels, spas, things like this, camps, <clears throat> cabins, a lot of these are empty because, well, the coronavirus has killed the travel and tourism industry. These could overnight become very makeshift, um, I guess you could call them refugee camps, just in a tower form. This would at least be a good stopgap until the bulk of our actual plan continues. And I swear I'm getting to this soon. Now, on top of the, you know, hotels, motels, um, spas, Airbnbs, anything like that, that we can use to house people. There's also community centers, which I know would be, you know, at risk of COVID and stuff, but just as a humanitarian crisis, these are the options open and available to us. Additionally, we have um, a lot of underutilized skating rinks, community centers, churches, and this is where the aspect of community becomes very important. If we can harness the power of community in churches, uh, various other local community centers and local organizations, um, various Canadians here in Canada, we have private refugee sponsorship. So there are communities and individuals and families who are very familiar with this process. They could easily become the beginnings of a mutual aid network to help sponsor American refugees and help figure out where to put these people, how to house them, how to feed them. And this is possible because we've done it before. Like I said, in Lebanon, they've managed to create an organizational structure for the processing of refugees. Now, in terms of putting them to work, that's a different story, but I'll get to that in a bit. Um, we also have here in Canada the inspiring story of um, Newfoundland and Labrador when in the wake of 9-11, the people of Gander seemingly had a doubling of their population overnight. And they thought, how do we, you know, feed, clothe, and room, and provide showers for all these people? And like that, their community came together and began to start calling up friends and neighbors of, oh, hey, we might need a generator, or, hey, can we organize some shuttle buses and just uh, various carpools so that we can get people to use showers at these community facilities or in so-and-so's home. It was a sight to behold, and it was wonderful, and that's why it has spurred so many stories and even a Broadway musical. But is that sustainable for a long period of time? For a period of 48 hours, which is what it was, that was fine. But how do we sustain that? For that, we can actually look to the Black Panthers and their free breakfast program as an initial inspiration. So what the Black Panthers did was for their free breakfast program, they um, went around to local grocery stores and shops to solicit food donations. They also, after some trial and error, figured out that it took about 10 people to run a free breakfast program to feed, I think it was 25 to 50 students. You needed, I think it was four servers serving the meals, two cooks cooking the meals, one person handled coat check, two people to serve as um, guards and to direct people to the area. And there was a last one who I forget, like maybe they collected the ticket or the chit or something like that. But they found out that 10 people could run an organization to feed 25 to 50 and for free. So that's a good start. And other people should look into this in terms of how we handle this in our local communities because Lord knows Americans might just be showing up across the border and it's a long ass border. So that's a good idea for free breakfast programs. And also they kind of use social pressure because if they came across a business or like a grocery store that didn't want to donate for um, free breakfast programs, they would then use their community networks to tell people, hey, don't support this business, and that business would feel the pinch. Here in Canada, we could easily do the same with our bigger grocery chains. Oh, Loblaws isn't making donations to help um, starving American refugees in the middle of winter. Guess we're all shopping at Sobeys or Metro or Provigo or whatever it is, right? Like you see how this could work. We could also do the same for clothing donations from larger companies. There's also a lot of clearance sales that offer, sure, they're not the best, but it's still clothes that would work in winter. So there are ways of doing this, but it has to be within local community leadership because this is going to be 
from coast to coast and it's going to be on the local communities especially those near the border that are going to have to be the primary focus now ultimately this does bring us back to the british commonwealth air training program because obviously we can't keep people in hotels forever so while these will be good temporary areas and you know churches and arenas and uh refurbish some old warehouses or empty storerooms that there's possibility right bring people into their homes and into their bubbles if it's a small individual or like a, a couple there are ways of doing this but additionally the main crux of this program which goes back to the british commonwealth our training program we can reuse some of these old airfields to be the start of small tiny home communities that can house americans and most importantly of all employ them for work this is usually the biggest struggle that faces any refugee crisis anywhere is well they're refugees and they're not entitled to work here's how we fix that right off the bat to just clear the backlog whoever has applied for a permanent visa for here in canada from america just instantly approved for at least a period of one year that clears the backlog it gives some breathing room and still time down the road to either renew it for another year to postpone it or to give time to actually review it and see if it should continue or be revoked additionally uh, this would allow for all the new applications that would no doubt come flooding in to begin to be processed additionally while that will take forever no matter what we do from a bureaucratic standpoint if we can start constructing these sort of tiny home communities and put them in you know military bases uh like summer camps and build some log cabin some new log cabins and stuff like that and kind of create small communities and check in with them and utilize groups that are used to this such as the red cross doctors without borders utilize the teams and the technology and the networks we have currently in existence to help manage a what would be an unprecedented humanitarian crisis and to spur not only canadian job creation we could build in these former airfields we could build tiny home communities so they're not very big but you know they're like sort of mini townhomes so they are very heat efficient they provide just enough space and something resembling an actual home for people and this is better than a tent which just wouldn't work in winter here especially in the prairies we build these homes and we allow americans to work within these communities that we can create on these former air bases we basically pass a law or provides of something that says if you are an american and you're fleeing from america and you come here you can take that sort of previous skill experience and your qualifications in america and apply them here basically it's kind of like we turn these former air bases into small mini americas little americavilles that have american labor laws apply to them obviously canadian law would apply but in terms of allowing them to work this would allow people to work so oh hey you're a plumber great no doubt this community would need a plumber same with electricians with farmers gardeners doctors uh secretaries clerks just this is how we prevent people from having just millions of people in our borders and not working and being scared and frustrated we provide them a kind of mental health outlet and show them an avenue for hope growth and opportunity and this in turn spurs canadian economic development because if these are a success well then oh guess we'd better start building more of those and that in turn spurs canadian infrastructure development and then what happens when this is all over guess what there's some new communities that could be moved into that's your housing for veterans that is your housing for homeless there are solutions here and the government talked about contingencies and i hope something along these lines are in there but if they're not then at least this is something that serves as the start of a plan and so i really need everyone to watch this and share it because a dark time is coming and this is what i have been trying to work on basically on my own but now it's time to debut it because we're in for a rough time 
and I'd like to have people be confident that there's at least a plan out there, that there are people thinking and trying to do something. So this is my offering to the internet and to the millions of scared Americans who are unsure what happens after November 3rd. So please, please spread this around, add to the plan. If I'm missing something, add it. If you have a better idea, share it because now is the time. It is unfortunately the time for this kind of talk and this kind of action. And that some people think that it isn't is definitely what's bothering me today.